Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual fall creative works and research event. Uh, we're going to get started in about five minutes while we're waiting for attendees to uh, sign in.
Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first virtual Fall Creative Works and Research event. Uh, we have six presentations for you this morning. Each of those presentations will be about five to 10 minutes long with time at the end for questions. If you do want to ask a question, I ask that you use the Q&A feature, which is on the right hand side of the menu bar at the bottom to ask that question. I will then repeat it to the participants uh, and, and then they will be able to answer it for you. All right, so I am looking forward to our presentations this morning. First up, we have Yamna Bukabar, who is going to talk to us about identification of soil-borne bacteria capable of antibiotic production. Over to you, Yamna. Hello everyone, my name is Yemna Vukovar and the title of my presentation is The Identification of Soil-Borne Bacteria Capable of Antibiotic Production. So some quick background, increasingly antibiotics have begun to lose their effectiveness due to the growing amount of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Bacterial infections that were once easily treated with antibiotics can now be deadly after six decades of rapid antibiotic usage by the medical community without consideration of, bacterial, of bacteria's adaptive capabilities. Bacteria, like any other organism, has the ability to adapt, has the ability to resist, and this is even amplified in bacteria because of their characteristics such as horizontal gene transfer and their ability to quickly share DNA. If this is not addressed immediately, this issue will only worsen. And this may leave scientists a few years down the road in a mad scramble for, for solutions. We must, the identification of a novel antibiotic producing bacteria is crucial. So where might we begin to look for such a novel antibiotic producing bacteria? Well, one source that is cheap, abundant, found nearly everywhere, probably even in your own backyard is the soil. Soil contains approximately 190 microorganisms per gram, 500 novel bacteria are found per year, and moreover, the source for 80% of antibiotics is soil-borne microorganisms. So really, soil is a no-brainer place to look. So in investigating this, our question is, would we be able to isolate antibiotic-producing bacteria from the soil? And I hypothesize that at least one bacterial isolate capable of producing antibiotics would be isolated, but it would not be novel. With that being said, I'm now going to discuss the methods we use to investigate this question. First off, we started with, so with soil sampling. Following the tiny earth protocols, five to 10 grams of local soil from Frick were collected, from Frick Hall, California University of Pennsylvania were collected and conditions such as temperature, weather, et cetera, were documented. The bacteria was suspended in sterile water to separate it from the soil, detritus, and other organisms. Then one gram of that suspended bacterial solution was used in a tenfold dilution via, via saline. From that serial dilution was plated on LB agar using the spread plate method. This was to uh, get a feasible count of colonies that was countable between that 30 to 300 golden range so that we would be able to measure the cell, cell density. Next, we used the pick and patch method and that's how we got our master plates. And we try to pick bacteria that appeared to be unique. From those master plates, we during the stationary phase of growth, we took observations of colony morphology. So descriptors such as color, texture, elevation, shape, and the margin, or like the edges of our bacterial isolates. We also, the next method we used was selective and differential media. So selective and differential media tests were done using the conchi agar and mannitol salt in order to determine if our bacterial isolates were gram negative or gram positive and to, to determine if they had the ability to ferment, to ferment mannitol or lactose. Lastly, we did a, we conduct, we used a spread patch test and this was done to determine if the isolates were antibiotic producers. Now that I have discussed the methods we use, I will discuss the results we found. So back to the serial dilution spread plates. Um, we looked at this first row and at this third plate was 32 colonies. So it's within that 30 to 300 range. And that's what I used to calculate the CFU. And when I calculated the CFU, I found it was 3.2 times 10 to the fifth colony forming units per gram. And so this means in that one gram of uh, bacterial suspended bacterial solution, that's how many bacterial cells are. And this is a number we never would have been able to get. You can't count 3.2 times 10 to the fifth bacteria. That would have been, it would have been nearly impossible, but using the serial dilution allowed us to get this estimate. 
Uh, next, this is master plate 13. And these are our islets during the stationary phase of growth. So a little summary of those observations we took. Most of them were yellow or white or in that color family, very curled or undulate margin, irregular shape. A lot of them were shiny, glistening in texture, but we did have one that was matte. We had a few that were matte. Additionally, if you notice this down here in the bottom corner, this is colony three and colony three was contaminated. So although we had plated 12 colonies, only 11 islets were viable. Uh, these are the results of the differential and selective media. To your left, you see the results of the McConkie agar. And then to your right, we have the mannitol salt results. So for the McConkie agar, uh, McConkie agar is going to be selective for gram negative bacteria. So any growth on these plates indicates that that bacterial isolate is gram negative. And an absence of growth probably means it's gram positive. And so we did have some growth here and we did have gram negative bacteria. Additionally, the color also indicates whether or not that bacteria is able to ferment lactose. Red media indicates the bacteria is a lactose fermenter, whereas yellow media indicates it is a non-lactose fermenter. And as you can see, we've had both yellow and red media, meaning we had both non-lactose fermenters and lactose fermenters. And the reason behind this color change is because lactose fermentation releases acid, which causes the pH to drop. And then absorption of neutral red by bacteria is what's eventually responsible for that red color you see here. Onto the mannitol. Um, mannitol is selectively preferential, is preferentially selective for gram positive, which means most of the time it'll select for gram positive, but occasionally some gram, gram negative can exhibit trace growth if it can tolerate high salt concentrations. So we did have some gram negative bacteria that exhibited trace growth here, but then we saw them grow in the McConkie. So we knew they were gram negative. We also did have some gram positive bacteria. Um, additionally, this MSA test, we we're also looking at the color. A yellow color would have a yellow media would have indicated that the bacteria was mannitol fermenter. Obviously, we have all red media and we had no mannitol fermenters, unfortunately. Um, so this is onto the results of our last test. And this was trying to screen for antibiotic producers. And we grew staph epi, bacillus, and pseudomonas. We spread them on the plate until we had a sort of a lawn of the bacteria was fully covered. And then we stuck our isolates, our isolates on and grew them on top. And we kind of tried to put them in the same spots as our master plate, try to mirror that. So we kind of know which was which. And what we were looking for is this zone of inhibition, a sort of clearing around. And this would indicate that that isolate was an antibiotic producer. And isolate 11 was the only isolate positive for antibiotic production. Interestingly enough, it was found in all three um, plates. This suggests it is some sort of broad spectrum antibiotic. It is equally effective on gram negative and gram positive bacteria because we did test all three. So it could be perhaps targeting protein synthesis or nucleotide synthesis. Uh, additionally, we also calculated the prevalence rates. And for master plate 13, it was 9.09%. But for the class data, it was a bit lower, 3.24%. And this may be because some students may have had no um, isolates capable of antibiotic production, hence why the class prevalence rate would be lower. Okay, so we have these results. What does it all mean? Well, first, the hypothesis is accepted in part because there was successful isolation of at least one antibiotic producer as predicted. However, a conclusion whether this bacteria is novel, I can't really make that at this point because we didn't really uh, test for that. I think this really opens the door for future exploration and further exper experimentation. A significant thing about the prevalence rates, however, is that you know, 9.09%, 3.24%, 3.24%, these, these rates confirm soil is a feasible source for antibiotic producing bacteria. We are fi finding antibiotic producing bacteria. We need to start crowdsourcing antibiotic discovery. We need to make it a priority. They're there, we need to, we need to crowdsource because this is the answer to that problem. We need to do it before antibiotic resistant bacteria and these infections become a problem that we can't handle. Um, with that being said, what's next? I think the most logical next step would be to try to determine the novelty of the isolated antibiotic producer. And this could be done 
uh, from the chemical side. We can take it from the chemical side and try to do metabolic identification via mass spectroscopy. And if we do determine this bacteria is novel and the significance for the medical communi community, I think would be very, very huge because this could be an antibiotic producing bacteria that these dangerous pathogens have not yet had the time to build resistance to. And this time around, we could learn from our mistakes. Instead of using it carelessly here and there, we can, you know, pace ourselves and make sure we don't, uh, you know, overuse for six decades as we've done once before. Overall, I hope from this presentation you take that the problem of antibiotic resistant bacteria is one you should care about. It's not going away and we must find a solution. And I hope you can see that within the so soil may lie our solution. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience in the Q&A? Oh, there is a question. So Dr. Ross is asking, can you share with us your motivation to explore this area of study? Do you have an interest in epidemiology? An interest in epidemiology? Honestly, I do have an interest in medicine as a whole. So I think, I think this stuff is very interesting, especially like antibiotics, probiotics, how that affects, you know, your gut microbiota. That's a little bit different, but over, like, I just think as a whole, like the whole antibiotic resistance, maybe we, we've used antibiotics too much. Maybe it's time to find something new. And I just think that's really cool. And I think if, if I mean, finding a new antibiotic producing bacteria would be just, if I could achieve that <laughs> during my <laughs> research career, that would be phenomenal, honestly. So it's a very, very cool field. And it's something that's definitely one of my interests. Excellent. Uh so the title of the presentation again was identification of soil borne bacteria capable of antibiotic production. So I have a question for you. Um, if you were going to identify that bacteria, I mean, I realized that it was not within the scope of your project right now. What, what do you think the next step would be? Do you have a guess also as what type of bacteria it might be? You know, I don't have a guess, but I do have ideas for actually several next steps we could take. So what we could do is we could do the differential and selective stains, do more of those tests and microscope, uh, and you look at it through microscopes and we could try to um, identify the organism. Another thing is we could try to, as I said at the end of my conclusion is I think we should try to categorize, characterize the metabolite. And I think using mass spectroscopy is an excellent way to do that. Looking at it from the chemical side, you try to analyze the compound that's serving as an antimicrobial. Another interesting thing um, is we could try to see how does this affect against eukaryotes? Would it hurt us? Because obviously there's no point in, in trying to use this antibiotic producing bacteria if it would be harmful. Right, if it's toxic to everything. Yep. Great answer. All right, thank you very much. If there are no more questions, I will move on. All right, thank you very much, Yamna. Next up, we have Yolanda Gassier, who is going to talk to us about Voice of the Sacred Cacao, a panorama of the history, culture, religion, ritual, and botany of chocolate. Hello. Uh, my name is Yolanda Garcia, and welcome to my presentation, Voice of the Sacred Cacao, the panorama of the history, culture, religion, ritual, and botany of chocolate. Chocolate is uh, the subject of my body of work. Um, it will embrace the history of chocolate, its cultural and religious importance in pre-Hispanic Mexico, that would be the Aztec and the Mayan cultures and the botany of the cacao tree. Uh, with this work, I'm exploring the origin of chocolate, its importance in Maya and Aztec civilizations, why the Maya and the Aztecs believed cacao was sacred, how they consumed and used chocolate in their ceremonies and rituals, and the impact chocolate had on post-conquest Mexico and on European society. Uh, my influences for this body of work are artists Frida Kahlo, Kahlo George O'Keefe, and Enrique Chigoya Dutch still life paintings, botanical illustrations, and illuminated manuscripts, and Dia de los Muertos or Dia de the Dead altars have also inspired my work. 
uh, this body of work, it will tell a story or a narrative through dramatic imagery with use of uh, text and color and mixed media. And I will be using chocolate within the artwork, um, I, using it as a medium. The cacao tree is native to Southern Mexico and to Central America. It is a tropical understory tree and it thrives in hot and humid climate. Its blossoms are about the size of a dime. They grow in clusters. And the clusters of blossoms and the cacao pods grow on the trunk of the tree and on the larger, on the size of the larger branches. Uh, 18th century Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus gave the cacao tree the name Theobroma cacao. The Theobroma is a Latin word which means food of the gods. And cacao comes from the Nahuatl word, chocolato, which means bitter water. And the Nahuatl language was spoken by the Aztecs. Now, cacao was sacred to the Mayans and the Aztecs. They consumed it as, as a beverage. Uh, they buried the cacao with the deceased royalty. It has been found uh, jars of, of filled with residue of cacao have been found in, in the uh, um, tombs of the, the gods. Um, some scholars believe that cacao was used as a vehicle for the Mayans and the Aztecs to ingest the psilocybin containing mushrooms or a hallucinogenic that is it was within particular mushrooms. And this gave them visions of their gods and they would take this during celebrations and rituals and sacrifices. This also, I think, made them feel like this caused them to ascend into a spiritual realm where they believed the gods lived or they existed. Um, this experience that they had in these visions may explain why it was, cacao is called the food of the gods and why only the nobility and the, nobel, the nobility and the royalty could partake in drinking of chocolate. Now with the Aztecs, even the women of the royalty and nobility could not partake in drinking of chocolate. This was only, men, men were only allowed to do that. Now at the bottom, there is a glyph. It's a Mayan glyph with the word cacao. And the, the comb or the fish fin and the fish um, the, comes from the, the Mayan word car or K, which is the word for fish. And the two dots represent the number two. And this tells the, the reader to pronounce the syllable ka twice. The wa is the suffix, which is the, it's a glyph that's at the bottom. It looks like the bottom fins of the fish. The a is an echo vowel. If you see the a in the parent and uh, a vowel in parentheses, that means the vowel is a echo vowel and it does not get pronounced. So when the glyph is, is red, it's red as cacao. You, you see it is written as a cacao, but it's actually pronounced cacao. Then the Spanish, they came to Mexico in 1519. Uh, Hernan Cortez, he was a Spanish conquistador. He and a group of his men, they landed on the shores of Mexico and during their exploration of the land, they come across the city Tenochtitlan, which is the Aztec Empire. It's where Mexico City sits today. Mexico City is built on top of this ancient Mayan or ancient Aztec city. And Cortez meets Montezuma II, and Montezuma II is the emperor of the Aztec Empire. Now, when he sees Cortez, he believes that Cortez is the, get, uh, the god Quetzalcoatl. And Quetzalcoatl in the Aztec legend was a white man with a beard. And he had helped the, the Aztecs um, how to grow food. And he had promised the Aztecs that he would come back. So when Montezuma sees 
Cortez, he believes he is Quetzalcoatl who has returned. So for tribute, he gives Cortez a, a group of young women, 19 women, and one of those women who is given the name Doña Marina, she's an indig indigenous woman, becomes very close to Cortez, she becomes his mistress, and she tells Cortez that Cacao is a very strong aphrodisiac. So Cortez writes to the King Charles V of Spain, and he tells him about how cacao is valued among the Aztecs. Now the Spanish start ex exporting cacao beans from uh, Mexico to Spain, and it becomes very popular there as a beverage. And in 1521, the Spanish conquer Mexico. And Spain keeps cacao a secret from the rest of Europe for over a hundred years until Maria Teresa, also known as La Infanta, who's the daughter of the King of Spain, King Philip the, the Fourth, she marries French King Louis the Fourteenth. And she brings chocolate with her to the French court, and it becomes very popular among the French nobility. And over time, chocolate uh, gains popularity uh, throughout um, Europe's elite class because they, were the, they could afford the cacao beans. This was not something that the common people um, could, could partake in um, because it was too expensive. Um, so this was something only the, the, the nobility and the very wealthy of Europe could drink. And demand for cacao uh, grew. And as that happened, Europeans who had colonies established um, throughout the world, they start growing cacao plantations in their colonies located in regions where cacao can flourish. Sorry about that. <laughs> I accidentally touched my, my uh, mouse. Um, Death by Chocolate, this is a visual narrative. This is my work, um, Muerte por Chocolate is, is the Spanish title. It means death by chocolate. Um, it is a narrative about the history and the culture of chocolate from its indigenous roots and how it was consumed in Europe and how it is consumed today in our times. It's a mixed media piece. And I do have uh, chocolate in the work. I use a cocoa powder, which I rubbed into the inner border of, of the piece. And I thought it was very important to have uh, chocolate as a physical presence in the work, um, since this is about chocolate. And the imagery I used is very narrative and symbolic. Uh, the sugar skull is the focal point of, my, of this piece. Uh, the sugar skull is associated with Dia de los Muertos, which is a Mexican uh, celebration of those who have passed, um, like loved ones who have passed on. And these altars are created by the family members and they're filled with uh, food items that the deceased loved in their, during their lifetime and other items. And one of those is chocolate and sugar skulls. And it's believed on the night, uh, celebrated November 2nd, that the spirits of these loved ones will come back to visit their family members. So the family has all these foods and flowers for, for their deceased loved ones, for their spirits as a tribute and offerings. So the, the skull itself is also a symbol of death and it was used often in Aztec and Mayan imagery and in their architecture. The jaguar, the, the Mayan word for jaguar is balam, and it symbolized the moon and it also represented the Aztec deity Quetzalcoatl, who was a feathered serpent god. And Quetzalcoatl was also represented by the moon. Um, the Aztecs believe Quetzalcoatl gave man the cacao tree and he showed man how to cultivate and process the cacao beans into chocolate. And I just do have spices. Um, there's canela or cinnamon and vanilla and chile, which was 
that were spices that were used that the Spanish, the Aztecs and the Mayans used to, to make the, the chocolate drink palatable because it is, it is bitter. And Frida Kahlo Chagoya um, are the artists that have influenced my work. Uh, Frida Kahlo's paintings are very strange narratives and they're full of detail and color and she uses a lot of Mexican imagery and uh, Enrique Chagoya's work has also inspired my, my work. And he creates codices. Um, and codices are accordion folded books that the Aztecs and the Mayans would use to record their history, their science, their, their um, astronomy, and um, their calendars and information about their deities. So Enrique, what he does is he, he creates these codices and he includes Mayan imagery and Aztec imagery. And he mixes those up with modern images and with text. And he uses various mediums to create dramatic visuals. And his, his work is pictured at the bottom. Um, Dia de los Muertos altars or ofrendas have also inspired my work and actually was the inspiration for me to create this body of work about chocolate. The altars are, are full of color and food offerings and flowers and sugar skulls and chocolate. And this is my work that I'm working on right now. It's about pollination. This is my work in progress. It's a dramatic narrative about the pollination of the cacao blossom by a species of fly called a midge. The cacao blossoms, as I said before, are about the size of a dime and they grow in clusters on the trunk of the tree and on the sides of the larger branches. Um, the midge itself ranges in size from one to three millimeters and it thrives in the decaying debris, the leaves and any fruit that is covering the, the forest floor. Now its tiny size allows it to enter into the hoods of the cacao blossoms where the pollen is located. And with this piece, um, I wanna create a visual drama and I've been, and in order to do that, I've enlarged the cacao blossom to take up most of the negative space. And I'm also gonna use color and variety of mediums and uh, text to create uh, more drama. Um, I will use chocolate in this piece as well. I'm going to rub the cacao, the cocoa powder in the inner border. And I'm also looking at mixing the cacao powder um, as a pigment into gum Arabic, which I will paint on the edges of the paper to look as if the paper has been dipped in chocolate. And this is my research I've done. This is some of it. Um, the picture on the right is a picture of my work in its early stages. And these are my sources. Um, if you have an interest in learning more about chocolate, then I recommend reading the book, The True History of Chocolate by Sophie Ko and Michael Ko. And also watching Michael Ko's lecture, which is on YouTube called More Than a Drink, Chocolate in the Pre-Columbian World. Um, he explains the, he talks about the, the chocolate process and, and its history in the Mayan and Aztec cultures. All right. Thank you for um, watching my video or my presentation. <laughs> and I hope you learned um, something about chocolate. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, again, if there are questions, if you want to put them in the Q&A. And I will ask you in the meantime, uh, I really like the way that you use your research to inform your art. Um, what did you, what would you say you learned that most surprised you uh, during that, your research? Oh, that chocolate came, that comes from a tree, that it's actually, um, comes from a plant. I, you know, I didn't, I never knew what it was. And, and I, I eat chocolate all the time. I have it in any form in my house. <laughs> and my husband will also bring chocolate home for me. But um, when I started looking into it as a subject to, uh, to do uh, some working, because originally I was just going to do a one piece about chocolate. And, and then it started, once I started learning more about the history um, and it's indigenous roots, and I'm my, I'm Mexican American, and knowing that it's an indigenous uh, tree from Mexico, it really sparked my interest to want to learn more. 
and delve into how the Mayans and the Aztecs used chocolate and how they consumed it. Um, but you know, it's uh, it was it was an in, it, it was an interest of mine. I love history, um, mm -hmm. and I also like to learn you know the sciences as well. And I, and I just want to you know develop more knowledge. I want to know more about the the cacao tree. I mean, it really, you know, to learn that this, this, this food starts out as a seed and it has no flavor. It doesn't taste like chocolate. And the only way it becomes to taste like chocolate is through the process of, of fermentation and drying and roasting. And then it's still bitter. It, it has the chocolate flavor, but it's bitter. And Sugar was something that was an old world uh, additive. Um, it would have been something the Europeans would have added. I'm not sure if it was the Spanish or I've heard different stories that it was Spanish monks that began adding sugar. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure because I've heard different things, but just that it came from a, a tree, you know, because mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> uh, and, and it's very interesting to learn this whole process. And, and the other thing is, you know, who or what, or who, you know, what was the, what was the catalyst to, 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 to turn this into chocolate? You know, it's right. believed that maybe the Olmecs, which was an even older civilization um, in Mesoamerica may have been the first people to um, process the cacao beans into chocolate. It's, it's still unsure. Some, some archeologists believe that they might have been the first ones, um, but you know who who came up with this process to create this, and why, you know why, you know, use it as a beverage. But my next right. piece that I want to do will be on the science and the the ritual of chocolate, which I think um, is so awesome. I, yeah, so it, it's I'm coming up with ideas on that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. So there were a couple of other questions. The first one I think you already addressed, like how did your interest in this topic begin? I'm gonna guess that's because you love yeah. chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you already <laughs> talked about it. <laughs> you know, I ate some before I, I got on here. <laughs> okay. And then so. just very quickly, um, do you ever sell any of your work or consider selling it? This is I from would. I just, I've, I've, um, I've sold one piece. <laughs> um, and I would be, yes, I would be interested in selling my work. I've been talking with my professor, um, my art professor about, you know, ways to get my artwork out and, you know, how I could, you know, sell it. Um, you know, I've, I'm a non-traditional student. I was a stay-at-home mom for 21 years. My oldest is a senior in, at Kent State University. And mm -hmm. my younger one is a senior in high school. So now I'm at that point in my life where I can start doing, spending more time on the things that I love. And my background is in graphic design, but I've been out of the, the field for so long that I would have to go back to school. And I really love right. fine art. I love to draw. And I decided I'm going to follow that path. And, but yes, I, I would be interested in selling my work. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> and this last question very quickly, because we need to get back onto the yeah. next presentation. Uh, one of, um, this is from uh, Beverly Ross. One, one of my favorite films is Chocolat. Do you know it? No, I do not, but I will oh, look that up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much then. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right, so next uh, we have a talk from Jaden King, who is going to talk about quarantined art. And I am actually gonna screen share this for Jaden, uh, and then Jaden is gonna take questions at the end. It's just titled Quarantine Art by Jaden King. So I'm about to talk about what mostly made during the start of the pandemic, and during this time I got the chance to be more experimental with my artwork. Um, before the pandemic and it's when I gained a much more better understanding of why I make the art that I do and why I want to pursue it in the future. I realized that creating these pieces that had no real meaning into something that now new purpose was my coping mechanism during this time and still is to this day. My first project that I did was with a friend at my old high school. And it was a meal that took us about four months due to class times and holiday vacations, and that's what it looks like. 
Here's some progress photos that I took in between. I did the wing on the right and my friend did the butterfly wing on the left. We both incorporated some different ideas and some similar ones to make it more cohesive. Um, this quote by Gandhi, Gandhi as was something I've always believed in, so I would be planning to put inside of the butterfly and we used the darker background with the brighter colors to make it more eye-catching for people to want to look at it and wonder what it is. And we decided to do this mural so that people could stand in front of it and take pictures with it and have it be a more interactive mural than other ones in the building. And it would show the artwork that we did and would also have a message and a quote that we could look at and look inside for that day. Um, next, I did these mannequin bedside tables that I made. I don't make them, I painted them, my bad. I came across these little portions of these mannequin stands at a store, and I had the idea to paint them. And that idea came immediately as soon as I saw them. There's some progress photos. I did two of them. And I wanted them to look almost like a three dimensional version of a thermal image. And I think I got that part down for the most part. And I use an app that showed me what it would look like. So I use that as a reference image to know where to put the colors at from certain angles that you look at them. Um, next, I have a custom headboard for a bed. Um, it was a twin size bed. And a family friend posted on um, social media asking if I didn't have to paint a matching headboard for her daughter's bed set. And I thought that would be a really good opportunity for me to paint something during this time. So I did. Uh, push on the left is my sketch that I did on it with where I had painted it. And I have a little sketchbook that I drew, a little idea of what I wanted. And that's uh, when I first had painted it. And at the time, I used a reference photo for the comforter so I could include the same colors and some of the same objects into the headboard that the bed had so it would look a lot better and have some togetherness. So that's the finished part of the light. And on the left is more of the flanker version of the painter. Next I made a ceramic tissue box cover. And in my swimming class we were instructed to make a functioning box of our choice. So I decided to make a tissue box and I want to go to college so I I chose how you paint. I selected a basic box out of play and then I played it after I got fired. I did not have a picture of it when it was left right. It was just a box. But on the left, I have out of my sketch of what I wanted it to look like and one of the colors down. And on the right, there's the finished product with the tissue inside showing that it's a tissue box cover. Um, next up, I have this CD disc mosaic mirror that I made. I uh, found an old mirror at a yard sale. I wanted to do some type of mosaic around the border. I just didn't know what I wanted to do with it besides just putting CD pieces on it. But that's what it's ended up looking like. I cut a stack of CDs into random shapes until I had enough to cover the frame. I used mosaic glue to attach each piece and made sure they fit together pretty nicely. On the left, there's a progress photo of it almost halfway down. And on the right, a lot of materials that I use to make it. Lastly, I have a sealer helmet and a painter's helmet. I was commissioned by a family member to paint them a custom sealer helmet with spikes made out of the size. It was my first commission that I ever received, and I sold it for a very long time. During that time, I had online classes once a year. That's what I did. So, that's it. I started off with a sketch. And canvas, and I started painting it. And I did have a little bit of money at the time to figure out how detailed it was. And it was something that I'd never do before. So I wanted to try that. And that's what it turned out like. And another progress been on the left. And lastly, this year has brought me many up and downs as well as others. I'm um, beyond glad that I have these opportunities to make and sell some of my artwork during the quarantine. And I probably would not be as motivated to do art now if it was not for the pandemic. And I'm happy I can make art to help myself and to make others happy, to make others happy as well. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions about Jaden? Thank you for your presentation. I will say I'm, I particularly liked your bedside tables. What gave you the idea to do the heat maps on those, Jaden? Um, I saw a lot of pictures on the internet of people like just doing them 2D. And when I saw them 3D and I was wanting to draw it, I decided to just combine them both because I had a good um, object to use the idea on. It was very effective. Thank you. So I have a question from Bill Malloy. How did being in quarantine impact your creative process? I love your art and I would second that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, being in quarantine, I was very limited of what I could do because of the materials that I had and what I didn't have. But being stuck in the house with nothing to do, I wanted to do more artwork and explore different mediums and just try to work with new things and I guess that's where most of my inspiration came from and just being in here the whole time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Okie dokie. Well, thank you very much, Jaden. Thank you. Next up, we have Educational Linguistics, Destroying Other Cultures by Eric Murphy. Over to you, Eric. All right, hi everyone. My name is Eric Murphy and this is my presentation on educational linguistics and uh, destroying other cultures and the dangers that come along with that. I'm a student at Edinburgh University. Um, the issue is pretty complex. Language plays a large role in education and government influence. Uh, government influence on language results in huge ramifications. This linguistic influence has been described. Oh, sorry about that has been described as synoptic legibility. Scholars specifically coined the term in relation to official languages. Languages play a role in how we learn, what we learn, how we interact, and who we interact with. In 2000, data from the US Census showed a 39% increase in Hispanic populations from just 10 years prior. Many counties became majority Spanish speaking. English education is an increasingly controversial topic. Native Americans were guaranteed native language education. However, their school systems lag far behind the rest of the nation. Uh, specifically, this relates back to a Supreme Court case in the 70s. A similar case is developed today, though, for millions of Spanish speakers, and the question remains as to whether U.S. education should require English assimilation. Here's a map I made just to show this. Counties labeled in orange are ones that were um, determined to be majority Spanish speaking in the 2000 census, and that is, of course, expanded over the last 20 years, and it'll be interesting to see how things have changed when the new census data is released here soon. Um, more than 97% of French speakers in Canada reside within just three provinces, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Ontario, specifically rural Ontario. French has long been a controversial part of Canadian education discussions just due to the price of new institutions for areas with little to no native French speakers. For example, Toronto's planned French only university brought about a large political feud. Ontario already maintains three bilingual universities. Many French speakers are bilingual, but some maintain a desire not to assimilate under English. Um, since I made this project, I believe that the university the French only university is still subject to cancellation, but that could change in the near future. Uh, again, here's a map I made just with data from the 2006 Canadian census. Uh, areas labeled in blue are uh, French speaking regions and some areas uh, in white 
either they speak English or there are just no people there at all. Like northern Quebec, it's not that it's uh, majority English speaking. It's just that there's really no one there. Um, it's mostly just dense wilderness, but you can see that most of the population resides in Quebec, New Brunswick, and uh, northern Ontario there. Going to a historical example of this, in the 19th century, the Third French Republic sought to further their control of what was then French Indochina, that's modern day Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. They did so by replacing the Chinese alphabet for Vietnamese with Romanized Vietnamese, uh, known as Quoc Ngo. Notably, this power grab brought them into military clashes with the forces of Ngu Dan Cao and Liu Yongfu, uh, both of them from China. Uh, Vietnam currently maintains 106 living languages. Nearly all of them are dying off. Vietnamese is the primary language of the nation, and this is especially true in major cities where the population resides. Uh, and again, here's a map I made just to show this with 2007 data collected by the United Nations. Um, areas labeled in red are majority uh, Vietnamese speaking. You can see near Ho Chi Minh City in Hanoi and along the coast. And areas beyond that don't necessarily have people that don't speak Vietnamese. It's just that they usually speak it at um, as their second or third language. And those areas are very uh, sparsely populated. Another historical example also comes from the 1800s, specifically in Hungary. Hungarian language laws were implemented to both educate and assimilate the Slavic and Romanian minorities. The percentage of mother tongue Hungarians rose from just 46.6% to 54.5% in just 30 years. Ultimately, Hungarians were not the only quote unquote accepted culture in the area. The Transylvanian Saxons and the Danube Swabians and other Germanic diasporas were also given preferential treatment. And here's a map I made from data from 1880 and 1910. The black outline there shows what was then Hungary, a lot larger than uh, Hungary today. And areas labeled in green were Hungarian speaking areas, but you can see that there are also Slovaks, Ukrainians, Romanians, Serbs, Croats, and Germans. Getting on to the concluding thought, language is obviously a vital part of society and how it evolves. A governmental body can use it to destroy other cultures in place of an accepted one. Large scale decisions of language policy should not be taken lightly. Hungary and Vietnam can and should be used as historical reference points for language policies and said policies are going to be especially important in the United States and Canada. It'll be interesting to see how things play out here in the United States. Um, we could take a route similar to that of the Canadians with a bilingual system, or we could just move towards English assimilation for Spanish speakers. I'd like to thank you for watching. This has been my presentation. All right, thank you very much. So again, if anybody wants to put questions in the Q&A, please do so. And I will start the ball rolling. Um, when you're talking about making a language policy, uh, you mentioned two possibilities. So bilingual or uh, just using English for assimilation. What are your thoughts on that based on your research? What would you recommend? Um, certainly many people want to move towards a bilingual system, but there is some problems with that that can arise like in Canada they specifically have two official languages English and French but that can potentially exclude anyone that immigrates from say uh, China India you know anywhere in the world and they don't speak those languages and they could try to learn three languages in total but um, I don't really have a I don't really lean one way or the other as mm -hmm. to the two policies. I think that both have benefits and drawbacks. So it'll be very interesting to see what uh, education officials do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was a great answer. Uh, any other questions? All right, in that case, thank you very much. That was great. Okay. so. Next up, we're going to have Amanda Lasser, 
and she's going to be talking to us about factors influencing Pennsylvania school districts return to school since the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Amanda. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Lesher. I'm from Edinburgh University. Um, my research was on factors influencing Pennsylvania school districts return to school since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, my hypothesis for this research was school districts located in areas with higher medium in household income levels and lower poverty levels are more likely to have half day or online only plans for the fall. And my second one was um, school districts located in areas with lower computer and internet access are more likely to have full time in person classes for the fall. <clears throat> um, my methods. I uh, um, randomly selected with a number generator 67 school districts, um, one from each county in Pennsylvania. Um, in these on the school districts' websites, I looked at their 2020 fall reopening plans that they had to turn into the state. Um, I looked at their the schools reopening platforms. If they are offering their students in person only classes, online only classes or in-person and online classes. Um, if they were offering in-person and classes, I looked at were they full-time, five days a week, half days, or a hybrid of two days at home, two days online. I also looked at their mask policies. Were they required to wear masks at all times other than 10 minute mask breaks? Mask only required when unable to social distance, um, no mask required or other. And then after I collected that data, I went on to the census quick facts and I collected data on average income, poverty levels, average education, racial diversity, computer access and internet access. And then um, I finally went to the CDC website um, and collected COVID-19 cases for each of the schools, districts, counties. Um, so out of the 67 school districts, I found only six opted for online only classes for their students. The other 61 school districts offered both in-person and online options for their students. So the six counties in the red are the six school districts that offered online only classes for their students. Um, so the counties in the blue are school districts that opted for full-time in-person classes, which were 34 school districts. The green count, the counties that are green are school districts opting for hybrid classes. Um, that, there was 27 of those. And then the six orange counties are the school districts offering online only classes. I found no, no schools out of the 67 offering half days to their students. For mass policies, 66 of the school districts required their students to wear masks at either all times other than 10 minute mask breaks or required to wear masks only when unable to social distance. One school I was unable to find their mask policies. Schools who were required to wear masks when unable to social distance provided a list of places to their students where masks must be worn. One thing I found interesting with their mask policies was in schools reopening plans, masks were only highly re recommended until the governor set in place the mask mandate order. Um, this map shows average education for the school districts. Um, so blue is your lowest, um, orange is medium and green is high. Four out of the six school districts opted for online only classes and had the highest average education between 90 and 95%. Um, your average education is high school and some college. Um, 
the two other school districts fell in between 83 and 85 percent. Schools opting for hybrid classes ranged from an 88 percent to a high of 93 percent. And schools opting for in-person classes had the lowest percentages ranging from 82 percent to 86 percent. Um, this map is computer access. Um, blue is the lowest percentage, and then purple goes up, green is medium to high, and orange is your highest percentages. Schools opting for online-owned classes had the highest percentage of computer accesses from 84 to 93%. School districts offering, offering hybrid classes um, had a range from 83% to a high of 91%. And your in-person classes had the lowest rates of 86 to 84%. Um, this is a map showing internet access for the schools, yellow being your lowest and your orange being the highest rates. Um, school districts opting for online only classes had a high, the highest rates of all from a 73 to an 89 percent. Hybrid schools with hybrid classes had a medium range of 71 percent to a high of 82 percent. And schools with in-person in classes had the lowest rates of 62 to 72 percent. This is your racial diversity, yellow being a low percentage of racial diversity with green being your highest. There is corresponding evidence in the data that shows school districts offering online classes had some of the highest percentages in racial diversity in their schools. Hybrid classes range from some of the lowest percents to some of the highest percents in racial diversity, while in-person classes fell into the most, most of the lowest percentages of racial diversity. This map shows average income for the school districts, red being your lowest and green being your highest income. Five out of the six schools opting for online classes fell into the two highest brackets for income rate, ranging from 68,000 to 90,000 a year with the six school, school district average income was 40,000. For schools opting for hybrid classes, their average income was 45,000 to 75,000 a year. And schools opting for in-person only classes had some of the lowest rates of average income ranging from 35,000 to 55,000 a year. This is our poverty levels per school district. Um, orange being your lowest and green being your highest. Um, five out of the six schools, districts opting for online only classes had the lowest rates of poverty, ranging from five to 10%. The sixth school district had a poverty rate of 24%. Um, hybrid schools with hybrid classes had a poverty rate of 8% to a high of 18%. And you've seen the highest poverty rates in in-person only class schools opting. Um, of 15% to 26%. The last map I had to show you is of COVID-19 cases for each of the school district's counties. Um, yellow being the lowest cases and red being your highest cases. Five, of, five out of the six school districts opting for online only classes had the highest amounts of COVID cases ranging from 10,000 to 32,000 cases. The six school district only had 1,700 cases. Schools opting for hybrid classes, um, they range from 500 cases to the highest of 10,000 cases. And schools opting for full-time in-person classes had the lowest number of cases ranging from one to 1,500 cases. So in conclusion, um, higher medium house, house come income and lower poverty levels correlate with schools opting for online only classes this year. Most of the six school districts opting for online only classes fell into the highest range average income bracket and had greater computer and internet access, higher education and greater racial diversity. These six school districts were also located in the counties with the highest 
COVID-19 cases. Um, lower computer and internet access correlates with school districts opting for full-time in-person classes. School districts that are opting for full-time in-person classes fell into the lowest brackets for average income, computer and internet access, average education and racial diversity, and were in one of the highest brackets for poverty. The counties these school districts were located in had some of the lowest cases of COVID-19. School districts opting for <coughs> hybrid classes fell in the middle to high brackets in terms of average income, computer access, internet access, and average education. They fell into lower to middle brackets for racial diversity and poverty levels. COVID-19 cases ranged from the lowest to some of the highest cases in each of the school district's counties. Um, for future um, research, I plan to continue building on this research by, build, by collecting data from a randomly selected number of states and school districts in those states, collecting the same data as I did in this project, school platform, in-person classes, platform mass policies, average income, um, average education, racial diversity, poverty levels, COVID-19 cases, computer access, and internet access. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, I have a question already. I know that you said that you were going to expand your project by looking at other states, but do you also plan to continue to track this, how it changes as the school year progresses from the schools you've already collected data from? Yes, I'd like to. Great. Yeah, I think it will be very interesting to see how it changes yes, over time. Definitely. So based on your research, uh, there were a number of different factors that you looked at. Oh, I have another question. I'm gonna ask you that from the Q&A first. Have you thought about collecting data on districts and special needs populations of children? No, I actually haven't. Um, when we first, me and my professor first talked about that we are gonna do public schools and private schools, but then we found out the number of public schools in Pennsylvania. So we decided to stay with public schools, <laughs> but right. I haven't thought of special needs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, that would be something I think that would be really interesting to explore as well. Um, I just wondered, you gave many different factors that you looked at, like computer access, internet access, uh, the number of cases. Did you also look at all at population density, whether that was a factor in schools deciding to be online or not? Um, I didn't, but I kind of thought about it. Um, I didn't look at the population because I noticed schools that did go online, they have higher cases of COVID, but they also have higher um, population densities. Right, exactly. So uh, yeah, I guess I wondered if, do you feel that the COVID cases were the like primary driving factor in them choosing to be online or? I, I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I have another question in the chat. Uh, how could the data you collected be used to improve future policies across the state? That's a good question. Um, it definitely gives you an insight on like um, what people really have for internet access and um, computer access and stuff like that. Um, and just, overall um what they have access to i guess <laughs> i don't yeah well it matters yeah so yeah, yeah that was great all right if there are no other questions then thank you very much and we will move on to our final presentation of the session so thank you amanda thank you all right next up we have hannah shumsky and she's going to talk about adjusting focus why secondary teachers should embrace video production within English and journalism education. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Hannah Shumsky. I am a senior secondary English education major and communication minor from Slippery Rock University. This, what I'm researching and presenting today was a class project I conducted in the fall 2019 semester 
involving four interviews with teachers in the Western Pennsylvania region about how they incorporate English writing and video production within English and journalism classrooms. So just a little bit more about me first. Uh, like I said, I'm pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Education. I'll be graduating in May 2021. I passed my practice for English already and anticipate uh, taking the communication one next semester, next month rather. Uh, and a lot of the background for me presenting this today, I'm also the editor-in-chief of the student newspaper on campus here, and I am a member of the TV news station on campus. So I have expertise and experience in both TV and writing side, the writing side. So I just wanted to explore how high schools explore that content versus college, which I'm more experienced with. And this uh, class project was conducted in the fall 2019 semester. I mentioned that specifically because I don't have any references to COVID-19 or the pandemic in this presentation because at the time of this interview, that was not a thought. So just wanted to uh, address that early on. And I previously researched the benefits of journalism education and the prominence of this for previous class projects. So I wanted to build off of my background there. And I also wanted to connect some of this research for this project into what I'm doing at the TV station. So just to start off with the status of what video production looks like in English classrooms today, the technologies that are in a classroom, so Kahoot, Nearpod, YouTube, Crash Course, which is a popular YouTube channel that I used whenever I was in high school. The vote is based, based on visuals. So being able to see uh, gestures in addition to audio, symbols, colors, and so on. So those are the technologies where you're looking at and you get more out of these technologies than you do specifically just by reading and looking at a text. At the same time, a lot of the skills that are already in video production are teaching in literature classrooms. So Lund goes into this a little bit. So some examples of this include planning, organizing, producing, polishing, evaluating, and employing reading, writing, speaking, listening skills, group dynamics, aesthetic judgment, and media literacy. So those are all skills that we're already trying to achieve in our 21st century literature classrooms that are also being seen in video production inherently. And there's also, with group dynamics specifically, the mention of a maker space or what Reed calls a shared workspace. You'll see this most often in television staffs or student newsrooms where students are working together. So while there might be different parts to what they're doing, they all need to come together to make a final product or a final goal in the end. So that's what a goal of video production could be. And then from the education side, we learn early on in my program about Bloom's taxonomy. So some of the higher skills, including analyzing, evaluating, and creating, which you can see on the left side of the screen, they're evidence of higher level thinking. So for video production, the selection of material and how you present it and in what order are all examples of those three areas and being able to think at a higher level, even if you don't inherently realize that you're trying to think at a different level at a higher level to get to your end product. And of course, producers of media are better evaluators of media. So as students are consuming new media daily and they are learning how different types of media, different types of sources and so on, at the same time while they're producing, they're engaging in that highest level creating still. So as they become producers of media and more experts in the process behind it, they become better evaluators in media in their own leisure time. And I also wanted to take a moment to compare the different types of processes. So Donald Murray comes up with the writing process, which he breaks down into pre-writing, writing, and rewriting. The majority of time is spent in the pre-writing stage. I believe it is between 60 and 70%. And you can jump between stages. So if you get to the rewriting process and you realize you need to do more research, you can go back to the pre-writing process and that's something he includes in this model. And for the video side with Kobayashi, they say that the video process includes writing the script and developing a storyboard, as well as locating images and film. So within all of that, you're already incorporating those three stages of writing with research, writing, rewriting, and culminating all those materials you want to use, as well as creating the digital story and publishing, which 
Murray does not address in how to publish in this research. On to my analysis of classrooms. I broke up the four classrooms into three different environments. We go from the most literature and writing heavy in one to the least writing and literature heavy, but the most technology heavy in three. And broadcast and print journalism, I put in the middle because it incorporates a little bit of both in a converged journalism model. And this slide shows where all these schools are from. So the first school is from Baldwin Wallace High School. And the third school is from Mount Lebanon High School. So they're three, one and three are both in uh, Allegheny County. Uh, as for the second environment with the print and journalism schools, Butler County had Butler Area Senior High School and Beaver County had Freedom Area High School. And again, those two had broadcast and print journalism programs, but to varying sizes. So that is why I incorporate both of those into that. One actually turns out to be more broadcast than heavy than the other. So that's another reason why I chose to select two schools for that environment. Now going over quickly each of these environments. The first environment was Mitch's, Mr. H's classroom. He teaches philosophy and humanities, science fiction, and literature and philosophy. And this is the Baldwin Wallace High School. That school information is roughly 1400 students in grades nine through 12. Uh, again, this classroom is the most writing literature heavy. So as for writing assignments, the smaller ones include journals and responses to articles and larger ones include research papers up to 10 pages in length. He also includes a film boot camp for his science fiction. So it's an introduction into how to analyze fiction as literature, media as literature. So for that, he's actually equating media literacy to literature literacy. So I feel that is an important distinction to make that he actually equates the two, not necessarily in video production, but in video analysis he does. As for video assignments, his most prominent assignment is to create an Arthurian legend in his British, or British literature class he has taught in the past. And for that, that required storyboarding, a 10 page script and a production process to create the actual video. So that's another example of writing throughout the way. So even though it's a video assignment, there's still writing incorporated in order to come up with a successful end product. As for environment two, we have to start Mr. R's classes. This is going to be the most prominent um, broadcast environment. So he teaches TV, television production, radio, and journalism. And his school actually has over 1,600 students in grades 7 through 12. This is Butler Area High School. For television pro project assignments, he has a silent movie project and commercials. And for those, he emphasized that the writing is required through treatments, strips, and storyboards. So he's very cognizant of how writing must be incorporated in the process before they even start to play to film. And as for news packages and documentaries, it's the same idea, but a little different because they must have the interview subjects before creating the story structure. So while they can plan all the, the students can plan all they want, at the end of the day, they must have the information from their interview sources and learn more about the story before they can actually create it and broadcast it. And he actually brings up a great point about teaching broadcast writing. And he says to be a more effective, quick communicator, maybe would be a benefit that could come out of this too. So if you're not familiar with the broadcaster communication side, different writing styles require different requirements or end products. So for broadcast writing and journalistic writing, you want your most important information presented first. However, for essay writing, you can take more time to go into depth about the story and explicating quotations and such. But with broadcast writing, you want your information straight to the point. So teaching different communication styles is a benefit that comes out of this classroom as well. And for the other environment to classroom, we have Mr. Epps classes. He teaches broadcast media workshop, print media workshop, and then two college and high school courses. This is the smallest school I studied. He has 500 students in grades nine through 12 in this high school. And this is a school one hour south of the other school. So this is Freedom Area High School. So in print media workshop, we have the student newspaper and the yearbook. So for those students need to write the pitches, interviews, and they undergo a five stage peer editing process. So in that alone, that's going to be the most explicit form of the makerspace we were talking about earlier. 
And then we also have broadcast media workshop in which students are responsible for the daily announcements, such as the, which are called the Bulldog Beat. And they have to create additional feature videos as quarterly assignments. And writing for this, you need to prepare for features this way, but this teacher actually called this a fighting battle, which will come up again in environment three. And to that, he says that it's very clear which students and which groups took the time to make these videos and plan these out versus just get through the video process and skip the planning. So planning and preparing for features is the sign of success because if students take the smallest amount of time possible for this, they're not going to have the most successful end product possible through this. And finally, for environment three, we have media arts. This is Mrs. K. She is the chairwoman of the media arts program at Mount Lebanon High School, and her classes are very hands-on. Her school is the highest population of the four with nearly 1,800 students in grades nine through 12. So for media arts, she says that her assignments require storyboards and reflections, but the grading focus is actually on the content versus expression style. So when students are completing these video projects, they're working on the content, not as much literary analysis or how they present information. So she actually goes on to say that her students are reluctant about writing and are not very enthusiastic about the literary analysis, which could be a factor that plays into print media workshop from the last environment we talked about and a distinction rather between the previous environment we spoke about and the first classroom. And she also mentioned specifically the Center for Media Literacy's five core concepts of media literacy. So instead of the standards for the state, she uses these to guide her classroom. So her many projects include media message, constructed media messages, unique languages, and commercial communication. So just some of the observations that came out of all four classrooms, both writing and video production were present in all four classrooms to some extent. However, for video, writing had to exist inherently because of pre-planning, script writing, storyboarding, and interview preparation. So students have to prepare these questions and research before they even go to the interview. There is also evidence of the International Society for Technology and Education Standards. So for Mr. H's film analysis, uh, film boot camp, if you will, he emphasized that media literacy and literary analysis must be equated. So symbols and being able to point out different modalities and have equate that with literary analysis is important when incorporating video production or film analysis in classrooms. There are also opportunities to use multiple modalities such as audio, color, text, motion, graphics, et cetera. And there's opportunities for reluctant writers as well. In a sense, it's disguised writing which going on to that, disguised writing within video production. So inherently, students may not understand or may not see how writing is important to the process, they just see it as planning. However, whenever they get into the process and plan it out, in a sense that's writing and preparing, just like you would be for an essay or an article or so on. So this can be beneficial for people who really want to get into filmmaking, people who are reluctant or unsure about writing, or special education students who feel that they do better with hands-on material versus reading and writing. It also gives students the exposure to the media they are already consuming daily. Um, and multimodal assessments, so assessments that use multiple modes just beyond text, they can extend students' skill sets for the ever-changing world developing around them. So for example, one of the most prominent examples of media to come out of the pandemic is the rise of TikTok. So an example assignment you might be able to give students would be to take a quote from the text and do a TikTok about it overnight and show the class the next day. So that's an example of being able to develop and include the type of media that students are already consuming to gain their interest. And in that way, they still have to go through the research to find the right audio and the right trend they wanna follow and they have to read and write to prepare properly. Video production can also not be successful without preparatory writing. That's something we emphasize at college here, and it seems that high schools also emphasize this as well, that if you cannot plan ahead, you don't put the time ahead to answer, ask, write questions ahead of time, schedule interviews, et cetera, and write through everything you need to, there's going to be something that falls down around the, along the way. 
And there's also opportunities to grow as active digital citizens, effective communicators, and empathetic storytellers. All of those are from the IST standards for students as well. So as students are engaging with this content, they are becoming more engaged in the digital society. They're communicating in different ways and they're learning how to tell stories in a way that best fits the meaning, the goal and their audience, which again, are all levels and all examples of higher level thinking. And just to touch on some future research I plan to do for this project, should I go on to graduate school, adjusting story in the pandemic, that's not something I discussed during this project because that was not part of the research questions at the time, but that would be something I look forward to learning more information about to see if any of these teacher adjusted or took away these video assignments just because of the hybrid or completely online year. Accessibility for students with disabilities is another area I did not include, but should I redo this on a larger scale like I would wish to, I would like to include some questions about students with disabilities and the impact of the digital divide because the um, economic status of Freedom Area and Beaver sorry, Butler area high schools are much different from Mount Lebanon and Baldwin Wallace. So that would be something I would be interested in pursuing at a different time. And that is my work cited. And I just wanted to thank you all for your time here. If you had any questions after the presentation, the Q&A, feel free to email me at that or follow me at my English slash education Twitter. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and stop the screen share and open for any questions. All right, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, there is a question already in the Q&A, so I will ask that one first. The school information demonstrates large student population in the district for the most part, but do you know approximately how large the classroom sizes are for the sampled environments? I am unsure. I don't believe any of those school districts that I studied had large auditorium classrooms. My assumption is for the media arts classrooms that those were smaller just because it requires a lot of group work um, and that makerspace. I know Freedoms is under 25 typically and Butler I believe is under 30. I'm not 100% sure about Baldwin Wallace which was the first environment but that would be something I would be interested in gathering and getting that information for if I continue this research. Great. Uh, so I had a question as well. So it seems very interesting to me that this is helpful for reluctant writers. It's a way of kind of, yeah, sneaky getting them to do writing assignments. I, I wondered if you or if anyone has done any research or if it's something you plan to look at. If people take a class like this and then go on to a, a more typical English composition class, does that make them less reluctant to write in the future if they've spent time doing this type of writing in the past? Do you have any information on that? Uh, let me double check. I don't believe any of my sources have confirmed if it worked or not, just because I focus specifically on uh, high school with this research. However, that can be something that we look into as well. I do believe that when um, you're communicating with different modes and such, it does open possibilities for different communication styles. So for example, um, just because I'm with the communication department at Slippery Rock as well, some students may not feel that they did well in English classes in high school, but however, seeing that they're good with hands-on and they're good with technology, they could very well go into the digital media department here. And they're still required writing courses for that as well, but that would be different than going into a literature or film analysis degree and just staying in with the theoretical side, if you will. But does that mean, it opens more opportunities, I feel. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, that was a great answer. Uh, I have another question in the chat. If you go on to graduate school, what area or areas do you hope to pursue? I love that question. I really appreciate <laughs> it. So my number one choice would be a journalism education program. So I know there's a program at Kent State. So hopefully one day I could look into that. It is an online program. Other than that, a, I have looked at the master's English composition and literature program at IUP. That's another program I'm interested in. I really am interested in exploring the intersection of education, English, and communication. So I don't believe there's a lot of emphasis on journalism or broadcast education from a higher level undergraduate standpoint. So that's something I'm really interested in exploring one day after I get the teaching job. Right. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I do think that this 
this type of experience of integrating a video into classroom, it really gives students a, a chance to perhaps engage more deeply with uh, the subject matter in a way that they might not otherwise. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah then just beyond text too. I mean, you yeah. have symbols, you have color. There's more modalities in a sense that you can do when analyzing a video, even though it's so interesting. There's more, it almost feels like sometimes there's more you can do with audio and video analysis than text, but we equate the two. Mm -hmm. So I find it really fascinating that there's more equating with that. And I'm really excited to become part of that professional community and bring my own tape to that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any final questions in the Q&A? If not, uh, thank you all so much for attending our very first virtual fall creative works and research event. And thank you so much to all our presenters today. You all did a great job. So well done. All right.